we had the need. He created Adam and Eve and didn't wait until they got hungry to think, oh, you need some food. And then he responded to them and, oh, you need to breathe. And then he gave them air. And God anticipated every need of Adam and Eve and the entire human race. That is a paradigm shift. I had one of my students come up and say, that's not a paradigm shift. That's a paraquarter shift. <laughs> that's a big shift. Amen. And so this is a huge, it changes everything if you understand that God has already done everything and he's seated at the Father's right hand and we aren't waiting on God to move. God is waiting on us to reach out and receive. And I've tried to balance this because sometimes people will take these truths that I'm talking about and so they just sit down and it's kind of like que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. God's already done it. There's no responsibility on me. It's not responsibility the way it's taught sometimes that you have to make God do something, but it is we have to respond to his ability. It's our response to his ability, responsibility. And we do have to respond. And there is a part that we have to play. And so I was talking about that. Yesterday we talked about uh, 2 Kings chapter 4 where Elisha refused to accept the responsibility for this widow's need. And he says, what do you have? And last night I was really trying to make the point that every one of us, God has already created the supply before you had the need and there is something he's put in your hand that will release his power. And, you know, we could just continue to talk about that because there's hundreds of different things for every different person. It's not the same thing. But the principle holds true that there's nobody who is just totally incapable of overcoming. It doesn't matter how bad your sickness is, how bad your finances are, how bad your emotional problems are. It doesn't matter how what's happened to you. God has anticipated your problem and created the supply before you ever had the need. And there is a way for you to turn that situation around. It's usually beyond our ability to figure it out, but that's the reason that, praise God, we have to be dependent upon God. And that's the reason the Holy Spirit is given to show us these things. And if we'll cooperate, you can overcome anything that the devil throws at you. I don't believe that there is anything too big for God in us and through us to deal with. Nothing. Man, I was sharing some great, great things with the interns today that would really fit right here, but I'm not going to share that. So what I want to talk about tonight is if all of this is true and if God has anticipated and if he's already created the supply and we just have to respond, why is it that we don't see all of this? If God's created this supply, why don't we see it come to pass? And I want to start here in Romans chapter 3. And in verse 27, I'm breaking right into the middle of what he said, but I've got other things I want to go to, so I'm not going to put it in his context. But it says here in Romans 3, 27, where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. And there's a lot in that verse. I could make a lot of different applications. But what I was wanting to point out is he says that law, faith is a law. Faith is governed by law. And this is what I want to get across tonight is that people have this concept that God evaluates us on an individual basis based on whether you've been studying enough, whether you're holy enough, whether you have unforgiveness in your heart, if you've done this and this and this. And if you, if you don't see the manifestation of God's power in your life in whatever area, most people just assume it's God that for some reason hasn't released it. For instance, I've gone to many funerals and heard people just say, well, their number must have been up. It was their time. It must not have been God's will for them to die. And they just assume that God controls whether a person dies or not. They believe that he has a day circled on a calendar in heaven and your number's up. Man, the scripture doesn't teach that. Moses said that the days of a man's life are threescore years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore, eighty years, yet is their uh, days labor and travail. So right there he showed you that if you're strong, you can extend your life. God doesn't have a certain time. When people die, it's not because God, God, their number was up and God was involved in it. 
It says in Hebrews chapter 2 that Jesus came to destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. How clear can you get it? God does not control when you die. God doesn't do all of this. God's not the one that's controlling if people get healed. You totally control whether or not you get healed. It's a law. There are laws of faith. And see, most people don't see the kingdom of God operating under laws. Again, they think that God is sitting there with a huge desk and all of these requests come across his desk and he reads it and says, approved or denied. <laughs> or you hadn't prayed enough, you hadn't fasted enough, you haven't suffered enough and whatever. And they think it's totally up to God that flips the switch and controls whether or not you're receiving. God created laws that govern how his kingdom work. And you know, in the natural realm, we've come to recognize this. But in the spiritual realm, people do not understand that the kingdom of God is run by laws. And so because of it, they will throw their request out to God. And if they don't see or feel the manifestation that they want, immediately they take it personal. Like, God, you must be upset with me. I know now why you didn't do it because I haven't been praying the way I should. I got mad on the way to church and I know you aren't going to answer my prayer. And we feel, this is why people make deals with God. You know, God, if you'll do this, I promise you, I'll go to church, I'll serve you, I'll do this. You know why? Because you believe that God is responding to you individually. And the moment you make it that way, then if you don't see a manifestation of what you're believing for, immediately you're offended or either feel rejected and condemned by God. And I want you to know God is not the one who is evaluating you. When you pray in the name of Jesus, God moves because of who Jesus is and not because of who you are. And you have access to everything that God is and everything that God can do through Jesus' holiness and not through yours. God is not rejecting you. There are people, I bet you, I can guarantee you that there are people right here in this room because I've dealt with people for so many years. There's people here who have prayed for somebody to be healed and somebody died and you took it personal. I've got a very good friend, a person who's a minister and ministers with me still to this day, but their son died. And as a result, I've heard them say many times, God could have healed him if he'd have wanted to. It's not true. God can't just heal a person. People think, well, he's God. He can do whatever he wants to. He says, I cannot lie. It's impossible for God to lie. When God gave you power and authority and told you to do things, if you don't cooperate, and sometimes it's not just you, but the person you're praying for has more control over their life than you do. And we often forget this. And so because we're so strong in faith, we just say, I'm believing for this person. I refuse to let them die. I quoted this the other night, but in Mark chapter 6, verse 5, it says, Jesus could do no mighty work in his hometown, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed for them. Heal them. Jesus, who was perfect and who had no limitations and was operating 100% in prayer, in intercession, in faith, in anointing, he was maximum everything he could do. It didn't say he wouldn't do. He could not do many things mighty works. And if you put that together with Matthew 13, 58, which is the exact same story, but just verbalized a little different, it says because of their unbelief. It wasn't because of his unbelief. It was because of their unbelief. If Jesus couldn't overcome other people's unbelief, who do you think you are that you can just overwhelm people's unbelief? And see, people don't understand this. And so they stand and they believe and they did everything that they've been taught. They had a hundred percent faith in their heart. And they prayed, and when they don't see the manifestation, they immediately think that God chose not to answer this prayer. God chose not to heal this person. That is not so. You do not understand the laws of the kingdom of God. You think it's just kind of up to God's whims, how he's feeling this day, whether or not he's in a good mood. It's not true. There are laws that govern how it works how God works. Look at this in Mark chapter 5, and let me show this to you from a scriptural example. In Mark chapter 5, 
And in verse 25, it says, And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse, when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? You know, the traditions and doctrines of men make the Word of God of none effect. And we have many traditions, and one of them is that God knows everything. Jesus, of course, was God. And so this was a rhetorical question. Jesus knew everything. This, he was saying this for the woman's benefit. But I don't believe that. I believe, I believe Jesus didn't know who touched his clothes. It says in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, that Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Does it make Jesus less God because he was born a baby and couldn't control his bowels? That was his physical body was a baby, but his spirit man was God. They, the angels came and worshiped him and said, Christ, the Lord at his birth. He was Lord at his birth. He did not grow into being Lord. In his spirit, man, he was perfect the instant he was born, but his body was a baby and it had to grow. And he had to learn to walk and learn how to talk. He did not come out of the womb speaking Hebrew. <laughs> I'm sure that he missed his mouth the first time he tried to feed himself, even though he was God. And he had to learn eye and hand coordination. He grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor. Do you know what the word favor is in Luke 2:52? the Greek word charis. He grew in grace. There's a great revelation in that. I hadn't got time to teach on that one. But Jesus had to grow. And you know what? It said he grew in wisdom. He had to learn things. He had to learn how to speak Hebrew. That doesn't diminish his divinity. He was God in the spirit, man. But his, his body was like a... Uh, Space suits. You know, if you want to go out into space, you can't exist in space without a space suit. And this is our earth suit. This is what allows us to exist here. And he got an earth suit. It wasn't sinful. It wasn't contaminated the way all of ours have been. But nonetheless, it was a physical body. And he had to grow. He did not know everything. Matter of fact, when he prayed in tongues in John chapter 11, or excuse me, when he groaned in the spirit, in John chapter 11, over Lazarus being raised from the dead, the scripture says in uh, Romans chapter 8, verse, what is that, 26 and 27, that the Spirit helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself with, uh, it maketh intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Jesus groaned in the Spirit twice. You know what he was doing? He was interceding and letting the Holy Spirit help his infirmity. I didn't talk about sickness. The word infirmity means a lack or an inadequacy. You could lack physical health, but you can also lack understanding. Jesus' physical mind, even though it was sinless and pure, it is beyond physical thinking to see a person who's been dead for four days and their body has already started decaying come back to life and be well. He had to get beyond his physical realm. So in that sense, his physical body was an infirmity. And he groaned in the spirit twice. And then when he stood at the grave, he says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. When did God hear him? When he groaned in the spirit. Groaning in the spirit is a form of intercession. And Jesus had to overcome his lack of thinking. It wasn't sinful. It was just natural. You don't see people that have been dead for four days come back to life and resurrect. And he had to get beyond himself. So anyway, I'm saying all of these things to say that when it says, who touched my clothes? I believe he meant just exactly what he said. He didn't know. He didn't see this white woman coming. He didn't have eyes in the back of his head. And he wasn't being a, stating a rhetorical question, he was just saying, who touched me? Because he didn't know who touched him. And then it says, and his disciples said unto him, thou seest the multitude thronging thee and sayest thou, who touched me? 
And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith, notice, thy faith, not my faith, your faith, hath made thee whole, go in peace, be whole of thy plague. And the reason I bring this out is to say that this illustrates that the kingdom of God operates by law. Jesus did not see this woman coming. He didn't size her up. He didn't draw on the Holy Spirit to know that she is sincere enough, that she was operating in faith, that she'd been doing everything right. And yet the virtue and the power of God flowed through him into this woman and he didn't even approve it. You know, what this reminds me of is like electricity. Did you know when God created the heavens and the earth, the law of electricity has been here since day one? I have heard a scientific thing that in a typical thunderstorm, there is enough electricity to power New York City for a year. Huge amount of electricity. And you know, you, you may not have it here, but in Colorado, we have such a dry climate that in the winter you walk and touch anything metal and it's bam, and you get a shock. And I mean, there's just a static electricity and stuff. And you know, electricity has been around. It's a law that God created. People could have been using electricity in Jesus' day. God didn't just create electricity. It's been here all along. We discovered how electricity works, and we still don't understand everything. You know, I, anyway, I don't want to get off on that, but Tesla was an awesome guy. He had a shop in Colorado Springs, and did you know, I forget the exact time of this. Um, I'd be wrong if I stated, but I think it was around 1900 or somewhere around there. But he shot a bolt of electricity from Colorado Springs the monument, which was 30 miles away and hit a dish this size through the air without anything. He did that in 1900. He set uh, light bulbs on poles with the wire going down into the ground. And he had something like 2000 of them all over the world, China, different places in the world. And at a certain time, he turned on every one of those light bulbs from Colorado Springs without any wires. And when he died, the United States government confiscated all of his records because he had the, he could levitate things. I've read experiments where you, he could levitate furniture and anything in a room and make the thing levitate all using electricity. And the United States confiscated all of his experiments and stuff because they saw it as a national security issue. And did you know there's things about electricity that we still don't understand? There's awesome things that are available. We've just understood a portion of it and been able to harness it, but they could have been using electricity lights thousands of years ago, but they didn't know. And is that because they were evil people and God didn't want them to know? No, the laws were here. It was our ignorance that kept us from harnessing and utilizing electricity. And I know that that's offensive to some people. So you're saying those people are ignorant. Well, they were. Ignorant means you don't know. <laughs> it doesn't mean they were bad. You know, Leonardo da Vinci, in my estimation, was a genius. He invented a helicopter that they have actually taken his plans and built it, and it flies. And he did that in the 1500s. Leonardo da Vinci was, an, was a genius, but he didn't know anything about electricity. I know more about electricity than Leonardo da Vinci did. You know what? We, we have a cumulative knowledge. We learn from each other. But there are laws that govern electricity. And... You know, if you were to have this attitude that most Christians have, and, and let's say that we came into this place tonight and somebody called up the electric company and said, hey, we've got thousands of people coming to hear Andrew Womack tonight. We need the electricity on. We need the air conditioning on. Would you please turn on the electricity? That, that doesn't work that way. They generate the power and it's delivered, but you have to go flip the switch and turn it on. And if you, it doesn't matter how serious your need was. It doesn't matter how desperate you are. You could sit there and tell them there's people that could be born again tonight. There's people that'll be healed tonight. There's people that this'll change their life. Please, please, please turn on the electricity. The electricity company is not the problem. 
They've delivered it to you, but you have control of it. You have to turn it on. It's the same thing. God has already done everything that you'll ever need. You aren't waiting on God to heal you, to deliver you, to give you joy. The Bible says in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, all of these things that I'm going to mention right here. You've already got them on the inside of you. The power is already generated. It's in you. If you aren't experiencing them, it's because you hadn't flipped the switch. This fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Faith is a fruit of the Spirit. Meekness and temperance. You've already got all of these things. You don't need God to give you faith. You don't need God to give you joy. You don't need God to give you peace or love. It's all in there. You've already got this. And the problem is we're saying, oh God, I just need to love this person. Would you please give me love? And instead of swip, flipping the switch and releasing what you've got, you approach God as if you have nothing and you're just begging him. That's like the person calling the electric company and pleading and trying to, you know, pity, have pity on us and please do this. The electric company's not going to send somebody out here to turn your lights on. They generate the power. You flip the switch. You know, I think it's Isaiah chapter 45, verse 11. And it says, concerning the works of my hands, command ye me. I used to struggle with that until I understood this principle that God has already done his part. He's already placed these things in us. I can't command God and make God do anything he hasn't already done. I can't command God to just wait on me and give me all of my selfish things. But anything that's been provided for me through God's grace, it's now on the inside of me and I can command that power. Matter of fact, it won't work until I do command it. I have to command it. In a sense, when I go flip the switch, I'm commanding this light to come on. And that's not because I'm the source. I'm not where the power is coming from. I could stick a light bulb in my mouth and it'll never come on. I am not the power source, but the power source has been put into this building and you go flip the switch and it'll come on. And in that sense, you commanded it. You made it happen. Now there's, you need to use wisdom because it's not you. It's not your power. It's the, it's the power of the Holy Spirit, but it's in you. It's at your disposal. And I've used this verse also in Acts chapter three, where Peter and John said, such as I have give I unto thee. And they just reached down and grabbed the man by the hand and immediately he was healed. And they said, I have it. They did have it. It wasn't their power, but it was at their disposal. It's God's power. And whether a person gets healed or not is not up to God. It's up to us, whether we know how to flip the switch and turn it on. And you could just take all kinds of physical laws. Like for instance, when a plane takes off, did you know that you could have flown from day one? Adam and Eve could have been flying in the 747 jet. It's not God that just created the laws. The laws have existed since day one, but man didn't understand what they were. And so it was just when the Wright brothers, you know, begin to experiment and stuff and they've learned and they've added cumulative knowledge to it. But when a plane takes off, God doesn't say, all right, I'm going to let this plane fly. No, he created laws. And those laws have been working since day one. God didn't create flight. He didn't all of a sudden make it so that man could fly. Those laws have been here. We just are learning and tapping into it. And I was just reading a thing about new planes that they're developing. It is fantastic. Some of the things coming. We, what we call flight today, in a, if the Lord tarries in another hundred years, they're going to look back and talk about how primitive we were. I can tell you there are just all kinds of things that we are discovering, but it's not all of a sudden that God is doing something new. These laws have been here all along and it's our ignorance which if that's offensive to you, it's our lack of knowledge <laughs> that keeps us from doing it. And did you know that just as there are physical laws that God does not violate, he created gravity, that's a law. Did you know if I drop this Bible, it's gonna fall because of gravity and I could drop it again and it's gonna fall and it'll fall as many times as I drop it because it's a law. It doesn't just work sometimes, it works every single time. And if it only worked in Minneapolis, St. Paul, but it didn't work in uh, Colorado, then it wouldn't be a law, it'd be a phenomenon. 
That means it works everywhere on this planet. It is a law. It's how things work. And he says that there is a law of faith. And it's because people don't know these laws that they aren't getting healed, that they aren't seeing prosperity, that they don't have joy and peace. It's not because God hasn't given and it's not because God's ticked off and upset with you because you aren't holy enough and good enough. God has settled all of that through Jesus and he's wiped away all of your sins, past, present, and even future sins. God's not upset at you. God's not even in a bad mood. But there are laws that govern how things work. You know, if somebody gave you a hundred seeds, you got a choice. Are you going to plant them or eat them? And the right choice would be to eat some for nourishment, but plant some. And the scripture uses this concerning finances. And yet most people aren't cooperating with the laws. They aren't taking a portion of what God has given them and planting it. But they're praying and saying, oh God, if you love me, supply my need. He does love you, but he gave you your need right here. It was in seed form. And because you didn't plan it, you aren't cooperating with the laws. That's like a person has got a plane with no wings. And you just, I don't care. I'm not going to follow the laws, but if you really love me, you'll make this thing fly. <laughs> Ask Icarus about that and all of these other people. You know what? It doesn't work that way. You're going to have to cooperate with the laws. And it's not personal if you crash and burn. These planes that crash and stuff. It's not God that all of a sudden suspended the laws of gravity and thrust and dynamics. You know, they had a plane in Colorado Springs that was banking on its approach. And at that thing, they don't know exactly what happened, but it accelerated and went right into the ground. And there wasn't anything larger than a foot or two square that was left of that plane. It killed every person on board. And they brought the NTSC, I think it is, out there. And they spent two years evaluating everything and they finally came to the conclusion we don't know what it was it was it was rare but did you know what they didn't say well gravity spiked <laughs> they didn't even consider it you know why because it's a law it's constant they they take that for granted you know that would make a logic if you if you eliminate everything else if the plane was working if they, why didn't they consider gravity just tripled all of a sudden because it's a law why didn't they say, well, you know, the law of aerodynamics for just that moment, it was suspended and that these things didn't work. Planes couldn't fly. They don't ever come up with that. There's certain things that are just laws and you don't, you don't mess with those. They never say, well, it was the law of aerodynamics quit. It was the law of gravity spike. No, there are laws. There are spiritual laws. There are laws that govern faith. And if you see a person who's saying all of the right things and looking like they're doing it right, but if it's not working and if they die, I guarantee it's not the laws that failed. Somehow we failed to operate and uh, submit and cooperate with what God said. And I know a lot of you don't like that. And so well, that puts responsibility on me. Absolutely. You know, if you pet a cat the wrong way and their hair stands up, you know how you solve that problem? You just turn the cat around and keep petting, amen, and it'll all lay down. So if what I said rubbed you the wrong way, just repent and turn around and it'll all lay down. Feel good, amen. I'm telling you, this blesses me. You know, I could give you... I could give you all kinds of examples. When I was younger, I had a lot of tragedy. My grandmother raised me. She died when I was eight years old, and I was there when that happened, and I lost my grandmother. I lost my dad when I was 12 years old, and I spent six weeks fasting and praying for him as a 12-year-old and believing God, and he died, and they told me it was God's will. I was engaged to a girl, and she died while I was in Vietnam. And I've seen a lot of things happen. And at first, it's like, God, don't you care? Don't you love me? Why did you let this happen? And you know what? It has ministered to me and blessed me to find out that God didn't reject me. God didn't will these things to happen. It was my ignorance. It was my dad's ignorance. My dad was the chairman of the deacons. He was a good man. He led people to the Lord, but he didn't know what the Word of God says. He was a Baptist, and we were taught that miracles passed away with the apostles. And it was, it was our ignorance and our unbelief that caused the problem, and that doesn't make him a bad person. 
just means we didn't know the word. And I guarantee you there is a famine for the true word of God in our culture, even in our churches today. And I know that the people that are here on a Tuesday night, you're the cream of the crop. You aren't the nod to God Sunday crowd. You're the fanatics or either a fanatic druggie here, one of the two. <laughs> and so I'm not criticizing you, but I can guarantee you among the people that are right here, there is a large number of people that you don't see what God has promised you coming to pass. You're frustrated. When I give an invitation and say, if you're struggling with some kind of a physical problem, stand up. It's not unusual in faith churches, spirit-filled faith churches, word of faith churches or whatever to see 80, 90% of the people stand. There is, you know, if the average Christian was arrested for being a Christian, there wouldn't be enough evidence to convict you. You're as sick as your neighbors. You're as fearful as your neighbors. You worry about things. You... When there is a downturn in the economy, you scrimp and save and cut back on your giving the same as the people that don't know the Lord. And again, that's probably not typical of this church because I know Mac ministers on prosperity and healing a lot. But I'm saying that the average Christian, we may believe in the Lord and eternity and stuff, but in the practical everyday things of the kingdom of God, we are woefully ignorant. This culture is baptized in unbelief. And the average Christian is plugged into it. You know, I was talking to the interns today and I talked about a number of different things, but one of the points that I made is that the young people today are more plugged into the world than any group of Christians have ever been in this, in the existence of the world. You have the sewage and the trash of the world flowing through your phone and your devices every single day and you pay big bucks to get it. You are exposed to stuff that people in generations past have never known. And then we wonder why things aren't working. Garbage in, garbage out. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Unbelief comes by hearing anything contrary to the Word of God. And we just listen and... I'm telling you, we, we sit here and think, well, I did everything I was supposed to do. Give me a break. There are laws that govern the kingdom of God, and if it's not working for you, it's not the laws that are wrong, it's you. Or someone around you. That's another thing is that Jesus had to shut the door on the unbelievers. Elijah kicked the people out. Uh, Elisha kicked the people out. Peter kicked the people out when he raised people from the dead. Sometimes it's because we won't separate ourselves from other people, and we're afraid we're going to offend somebody. So we let them speak their doubt over us. You know, I've seen a lot of people healed. We got some great testimonies and some of the greatest testimonies I've ever seen are people that were, I'm sure they were considered crazy by normal people. But you know what? When they, when a tragedy happened and they were in the hospital, they would kick family members out. They would kick the doctors out. They would tell the nurses, if you're going to speak unbelief, don't you come in here. And they just get fanatical and refuse to allow anything contrary to what God's word says to be spoken. And guess what? Those people get healed. But the ones who, they may believe the exact same things, but I wouldn't offend anybody. They'll think I'm crazy. And so we just kind of pray under our breath. Those are the ones that die. Most people are afraid to take a stand. They're afraid of what people are going to say. And the scripture says in John 5, 44, Jesus said, how can you believe which receive honor one from another and seek not the honor that comes from God alone? If you are constantly evaluating, what are people going to think about me if I say this? If you act one way at church, but a different way on the job because you're, you're working in a secular position, then you know what? You haven't tapped into the laws of God yet. You're letting the fear of man. It says in Proverbs 29, 25, that the fear of man brings a snare. And if you're fearful of people and if they're rejection, if somebody rolling their eyes at you and saying something is going to shut you up, you know what? Your faith is not strong enough to turn on a light. There are laws that govern how faith works. So let's look back here in Mark chapter 5 and let's just look at a couple of laws. 
You know, I don't, I've never sat down and counted it, but I bet you I could name a hundred things that God has shown me about how the kingdom works, laws that have to be governed. And there's only four or five right here. And I don't know all of the laws yet because I don't see perfect results. But I'm, I'm confident that it's not God and it's not the kingdom that's not working. It's me that hasn't learned everything. And I've learned a lot. And the more I learn, the more I see happen and the better it happens and the quicker it happens. And I've, I've come so far that I know I'm on the right track. I know that what God is showing me is true. I don't claim that I've arrived, but bless God, I've left. And I know I'm headed in the right direction. So look at some of these things right here in verse 25, a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered but rather grew worse when she had heard of Jesus. Here's one of the first laws. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing. You've already got faith in your spirit. It's a fruit of the spirit. But one of the ways you get it out and start this flow of faith is to renew your mind through the Word of God. And brothers and sisters, again, you aren't the typical person because you're out here on a Tuesday night. But you know what? The vast majority of us spend so much more time in the world system thinking the wrong things than we do the Word of God. You are going to have to get the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You need to renew your mind. You know, you've got this internship here in this church. I don't know why everybody isn't taking advantage of it. Now, again, I know that they go during the day and stuff. But, you know, there's Bible college. There's, there's online things. There's, the Word of God is so available today. You know, the average person, I've heard a stat that the average person spends anywhere from four to five hours per day watching television. And if you were to add to that, how much time you spend on your phone texting and reading things, you could come up with an easy six or seven hours a day that you could spend renewing your mind if you wanted to. But we just put more importance on hearing that this person had this for lunch. And I'm now walking into this room. And uh, I think I'm going to go get my nails done today. And those things are vitally important. And I can understand why that's really a struggle for you to get away from that stuff. But if you're going to have to renew your mind, you're going to have to put a priority on the Word of God. You know, and I, the way that I kind of got started, I was thrown into this because I was drafted and sent to Vietnam. And in Vietnam... Sin was so prevalent. They would, they would take you back for a stand down every, I forgot what it was, 60 or 90 days. And the government would pay for all the booze that you could drink. You, every single person could get as drunk as they wanted to. There was also free dope. And they would bring in showgirls is what they would say. But the truth is they were all prostitutes. And you could have all the free sex and all the free drugs and the free booze that you wanted for three days. And people would get absolutely stoned. And I was... The only person that I'm aware of out of my company of 200 people that didn't participate. And I just stand there by myself and everybody else is doing all of this. And I guarantee you it was like a magnet drawing me. And man, the desire, the pull to be like everybody else was there. And I didn't speak in tongues at that time. And I would have to stand there and just scream at the top of my lungs, no, I won't do this. And then I lived in a bunker that was wallpapered <clears throat> with nude pictures. On the ceiling, the walls, <coughs> everything. And so the only way I could keep my mind on the Lord was just like this, amen. <laughs> I sat there for 15 hours a day just like this. And I wouldn't even put my Bible down and think about it because I'd see something. So I just was like this. And for 15 hours a day for 14 months, I just studied the Word day and night. And you know what? It began to change me. It began to change things. And I know some of you, well, I'm not in that desperate of a situation. Actually, in some ways, it's more desperate because it's more subtle. It's not as obvious to you. But I guarantee you, some of you are allowing the sewage of this world to just flow through your mind. And then you wonder why it is that you don't seem to be able to operate in faith. Faith comes by hearing. This woman heard. If somebody hadn't have told her the truth, 
She had never had faith for this miracle. So that's one of the laws of God. You've got to hear. You've got to be in the Word. If you want to see the kingdom work, you need to put a priority on God and put God's Word first and put something else aside. Amen. 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 Some of you are looking at me like, who would do that? I wish I could go home with you and follow you around and just be there to tell you, hey, is this really kingdom here? Is this really going to help you grow? Is this going to help you get healed? Is this, you know, and if I was to follow you around, I bet you you'd see real quick that there's a lot of things you do that you could do without. Amen or oh me. So when she had heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind. Here's another law. Faith without works is dead. James chapter 2, verse 20. It's no good to hear unless you act on it. And there's a lot of people that will hear, but then they're afraid to act because, again, they might be criticized. Somebody might uh, roll their eyes at them. Somebody might say, you're a fanatic. Just, you know, all kinds of different reasons. There's people that have pain in their body and they're afraid, oh, I'll, I'll feel a pain if I, if I go ahead and act like I'm healed and start doing things. Man, I'm just the opposite. When I have a pain, I'll get up and do exactly what I do not feel like doing. You know, back in the very beginning, um, I, we lived in a place in Seagaville, Texas, and I went out to open up the garage door and our garage door would stick and I just jerked it up and that thing stuck and I did something to my back and threw my back out, my shoulder blades touched in the back. I don't know what happened, but I was like this, and it was excruciating pain. And I fell on the ground, and my oldest son, Joshua, was one year old at the time. And all I could do was whisper. I said, Joshua, go get Mommy. And he'd go, Mommy? And he'd just say, Mommy, and he didn't go do anything. So I was whispering, trying to get help. And finally, after a while, Jamie came out, and found me laying on the, on the ground. And she says, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and I whispered to her and I said, I need you to pray. So she prayed and then she says, get up, <laughs> act healed. And so, you know what I did? I got up and I spent eight hours doing push-ups, sit-ups, doing the things that hurt, fighting against this thing. And I wasn't about to go lay down and act sick because if it was in the middle of the day. I wouldn't normally go lay down, and so I wouldn't go lay down when I felt bad. I waited until it was time to go to bed, and I laid down, went to sleep, asked God to bless me. I slept all night long, woke up in the morning, laid in bed, and thought, man, don't feel any pain. I stood up, and immediately my shoulder blades <laughs> went back, and that pain came back. And that was the day I was going to be ordained to the ministry. And boy, all day long, I was having thoughts like, oh yeah, this is going to be awesome. You stand in there as a great man of faith and power, amen, like this. <laughs> and I thought of just canceling the whole thing. I couldn't go. And I thought, no, if I, want, if I didn't have something happen, I'd go. I'm going to act like I'm healed. And we were actually getting ready. And at that time, I didn't have a shower. I had to sit in the bathtub and wash my hair. And when I put my head over was when it hurt the most. And I started to just not wash my hair. I was thinking about asking Jamie to come wash my hair for me. And I thought, no, I wouldn't ask her to wash my hair normally. I'm going to wash my hair. And I just started praying in tongues and put my head there. And somewhere between the first and the second rinse, all of the pain left. And I've been okay. And man, I, I've been out breaking boulders with the pick this last week and working hard and stuff. And I've never had any back problems. And I guarantee you, I had something seriously wrong. But you know what? Faith without works is dead. And when you're laying in bed saying, in the name of Jesus, I'm healed, and you're talking sick and acting sick and letting your wife rub your fevered brow, your faith is dead. Amen. There's a balance to this. You don't need to do stupid stuff. And if you're if you're believing God for your eyes, don't throw your glasses away and drive and have a wreck and kill somebody else who wasn't believing. There's a balance. That's what pastors are for. Mark, Mac is going to fix all of this when I'm gone. He'll get up and he'll tell you the right way to do all this. Amen. I've given him enough preaching material for a month. Amen. But I'm not going to take time to put it in balance. Let Mac do that. But I'm saying, you know what? This is a law of God. She acted. 
If she would have stayed home and said, man, I know if I could just get to Jesus, I'd be healed. But she never acted on it. She wouldn't have ever been healed. So you have to hear. You have to act. And then it goes on to say, she heard of Jesus. She came in the press behind and touched his garment. Here's, a, here's another law that is not written here, but I think it's obvious. You know, the disciples said, you see the crowd thronging you. The word throng means to press on. Jesus had already healed a person by them just touching the hem of his garment. So this wasn't the first time it had happened. Word had gotten out. And as he was walking through this crowd, people were thronging him. That means they were touching him, wanting this virtue. And yet only one person had the virtue flow out. And yet lots of people were touching him. And his disciples says, everybody's touching you. Why didn't the power flow? Because they didn't put the laws into place. It's just like the laws of electricity. Did you know that a bird can sit on an electric wire and they never get shocked? You know why? Because they aren't grounded. If you, you can grab an electric wire and if you aren't grounded, it won't hurt you. But you touch a telephone pole, you touch something else and it's not personal. The electric company doesn't say, I'll teach them. I'm going to make an example. I'm going to electrocute this person and show them. There's nothing personal about it. There's just laws that govern it. It's laws. It's not personal. They didn't electrocute you on purpose. If you flip the switch and it doesn't work, it's not personal. An electrical line is down somewhere. Something is happening. There's laws. And if it's not working, the laws somehow or another aren't working. This woman touched him and the power flowed to her and it didn't flow to the others. And you know why? I think one of the things that's not stated, but to me it's obvious, this woman, I don't know exactly the right terminology, might be desperate or fanatic or committed or something. But this woman was not passive. She wasn't just saying, well, I'm going to try this. Man, she was committed. And you know, she had an issue of blood. And according to the law, she couldn't go in public. Anybody who touched her or anybody that she touched was unclean. And because of it, the custom was that she would have to yell unclean and people would give her a wide berth. For her to be in a crowd like this and touching people meant that they could have stoned her to death. This woman was putting her life at risk. And it says she touched the hem of his garment. That's like touching the bottom of my jeans right here. You know, if I had hundreds of people around me and all of a sudden somebody touched the bottom of my jeans, I guarantee you they didn't just walk up in the crowd and then gingerly bend over and touch it. For a crowd to be thronging him like this, to me it implies that this woman was crawling on her hands and knees through that crowd, pushing her way through. This woman was desperate. This woman wasn't going to take no for an answer. This woman was committed all of those things are laws that govern. As long as you can live without the power of God flowing through you, you will. As long as you say, all right, well, I think I'll try this. And if the Lord comes through in the next five minutes before my favorite show comes on, well, then I'll receive. Doesn't work that way. You got it. When you get committed... When you get to a place, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I've had all of this I'm going to take, and you just get angry. Did you know anger is a really, really positive, good thing if it's not directed at people? But if it's directed at sickness and poverty and mediocrity, you need to get mad. We've got a command to be angry and sin not. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. It's a command. There is a godly type of anger it says you're supposed to hate that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. Let your love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. God gave us all a capacity for hate. Every person in here, sometime or another, has used hatred and anger. And usually it's wrong. It's at people. But we aren't wrestling with flesh and blood. God gave you the ability to get anger, angry so that you won't tolerate poverty and sickness and anger and strife. We got too many passive Christians and there's Christians that can just adapt to about anything. They don't like the way our nation's going, but you know what? I'm just going to roll with the punches and stuff. You need to get angry. 
you ought to be furious. Amen. So this woman was desperate, crawling through the crowd, and she touched his garment, for she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. Here's another great law of God. Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it will eat the fruit thereof. Words are powerful. Words created this physical world. Everything physical. You and I were created by words. Words are the parent force. Words are more powerful than an atomic bomb. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And not only your tongue, but every tongue, every word that you hear is either ministering life or death. Every word. It didn't say death and life and a whole bunch of other stuff. Every word is either life or death. Every word. Every program that you watch, every news broadcast, everything that you read, every word that comes to you is either ministering life or death. And if somebody says, well, I, you know, I'm just mature enough. It doesn't bother me. I can watch these programs where people use profanity, blaspheme God, talk about there being no God. They come to all these conclusions that are contrary to what I believe and what the Word says, but it doesn't bother me. 1 Corinthians 15, says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. If you say, oh, I can do it, it doesn't bother me. You're deceived. You're already deceived. The Bible clearly says, don't be deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. And it's only either good or evil. There is no in-between. Every word that you hear is either building you up or tearing you down. Words have formed your opinions. Words make you receptive or rejecting towards things. There's many of us that you just go around and, well, everybody in my family has always had this problem. It's a genetic problem. And you just speak it. And you think, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm just saying what the facts are. Jesus said, you know, he spoke to the fig tree, cursed the fig tree, and the fig tree died. 24 hours later, it was totally dead. And his disciples were amazed. And he said, have faith in God. You know, we don't have the benefit of hearing the inflection of his voice. I'm sure that when the disciples said, they didn't say, Master, the fig tree that you cursed is withered away. It was more like, wow, look at that fig tree. It's dead. You didn't touch it. You just spoke to it and it's dead. And we don't have the benefit of hearing Jesus' response either. But I believe it was more, instead of saying, have faith in God, it was more like, have faith in God. What's wrong with you? No wonder they were called disciples. <laughs> How dumb can you get and still breathe? Man, they'd seen him walk on the water. They'd seen him raise the dead. They, and yet they were shocked to see him speak to a fig tree. And so he began to tell them how he did it. He said, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith will come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Three times when he was explaining to them how he did this, it had to do with words. Words have life and death in it. And our society today doesn't put this importance on words. Did you know it says you have to believe that what you say, what you say comes to pass. And yet we all of the time will say things like, oh, I'll meet you at seven. And you don't even leave home till seven. You gave your word. And you broke it. And did you know every time you do that, you say, well, it's not a big thing. You just taught your heart that you don't mean what you say. And it's going to be impossible for you to speak to the fig tree or to speak to the mountain or to speak to your sickness and your heart does differentiate. Is this different than when he says he's going to do this and do this and do this and he doesn't do it? Your heart will just come to realize, you know what? You don't believe what you say. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 15 verse 4 that a godly man will swear to his own hurt and change not. You know, I'm going to say something political. Please give me some grace if you disagree with me. But it's a great example of what I'm talking about. So just cut me some slack, amen. 
But my guy was Ted Cruz, is who I would have voted for probably. But I'm, I'm going to vote for uh, Trump because he's certainly better than the alternative as far as I can see. But here's my point. Ted Cruz gave his word that he would support whoever the Republicans nominated. And because Trump insulted his father and his mother, which I can understand that, and I can understand that's offensive, he broke his word. He put his own ego ahead of what is best for the country. And again, you may disagree with my conclusions, but I don't think you could disagree that he broke his word. He promised he would support whoever they chose, and he broke his word. And did you know, any time you do that, a godly man will swear to his own hurt and not change, even if it's to your disadvantage. When you do stuff like that, when you say that you're going to do something, don't do it. You have just taught your heart that you don't mean what you say. And you'll never see the fig tree die. You'll never see the mountain cut cast into the sea. You violated the laws of faith. You say, I'll pray for you. And you never pray for them. You've just deceived your own heart. Your wife said, does this dress make me look fat? You know, I try and deflect stuff like that. I've had people before come up and say, does this make me look fat? And I say, you know what? I'm not the fashion police. You don't want, I don't know. And I'll try and sidestep it. But if they say, no, I want to know what you think. Well, then you better brace yourself for what I think because I'm going to tell you what I think. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, man, that really makes you look good. I'll say, no, you fat thing. It, you look fat, oh, man. And you can say what you want to, but when I speak, what I speak comes to pass because I believe what I say. I don't say things I don't believe. Amen? You ugly thing. Amen? <laughs> Now, again, you can use a lot more tact than what I do. I, this is one reason I'm not a pastor. Man, the closer you get to me, the probably the less you'd like. So, but I'm telling you, you got to get to a place to where you speak what you say. I had a guy come to my office and he was going to uh, install a burglar alarm thing. And we had an appointment at like 1030 or something. And I had a lot of things to do, but it was on my schedule. So I made a spot, and he didn't show up until nearly 11 o'clock. He was nearly 30 minutes late. And when he walked in, I was standing there, and he says, I'm sorry I'm late, but I got caught in traffic. And I noticed on his belt, he had a holster, and he had a phone. And I said, you had a phone? You could have called, and he said, well, yeah, I guess I could have, but you know, I'm here now. And I said, I don't need you. And he says, but I'm here. I was going to give a demonstration. I said, you said you'd be here at 1030 and it's nearly 11. You didn't keep your word. I said, if this is the way you're going to treat me before you get my business, what are you going to do after you get my business? I said, you aren't a man of integrity. I said, I don't want what you got to sell. And I kicked the guy out. And some people thought, well, that's hardcore. I thought you were a grace guy. I am grace. I'm grace through and through, but I also understand how the kingdom works. And a godly person, if they tell you that they'll be there at seven o'clock, you can have the food sitting on the table at seven o'clock because they'll be there. Or if they have a wreck, they'll call and let you know about it, but they are going to keep their word. And if you're the kind that just gets there any time around when you said it was time to get, you're, you're an ungodly person. I'm not against you. God loves you. But the word ungodly means not like God. God will never tell you he's going to do something and then not do it. Over in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Jesus is the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and he upholds all things by the word of his power. God spoke the worlds, the universe into existence, and it's held together by the integrity of his word. If God ever lied, if he ever said he'd be someplace at five and he gets there at 5.05, the universe, you and I would self-destruct. It's held together by the integrity of his word. 
That's the way that God is. And if you aren't like that, you are ungodly. Not like God is what the word ungodly means. Here's another reason I never pastored a big church is because I'd preach on this and I'd, you know, if a person came in late, I'd say, come on in, we welcome you, you ungodly thing. And I'd make a joke out of it. <laughs> never had very many people come to my church, but everybody who came was always on time. <laughs> Boy, with Mike here, if you go somewhere with Mike, if you aren't 10 minutes early, you're late. You know what? It's important. And most of us, well, that's not that big of a deal. But you just continue to be sick. You continue to be poor and don't, you know, and then you'll pray and you'll get hold of Mike's teaching about speaking the word. And so when it comes to something you want, you'll go to confess in the word, but then the rest of your life, 99%, you just say things and not mean it. And your heart can't distinguish between those. It's a law of God. You have to believe that what you say comes to pass. So a person comes up, how are you? Oh, I'm dying. I'm dying. Man, I got a pain. I... And there's some people that you're afraid, you're, you're sorry that you asked because they just go through a list and tell you everything and say, honestly, I didn't, that was too much information, <laughs> amen. I didn't want to know about all of this, but, and then you wonder why aren't I healed? All you're doing is speaking death. Again, Mark 11, 24, 23 says, whosoever shall say unto this mountain. See, here's another thing. You don't talk to God about your mountain. You talk to your mountain about God. Most Christians are saying, oh God, I got this problem over here. The doctor says this, the banker said this. Oh God, and you talk to God about your problem. God told you to talk to your problem, your, your mountain. You talked it. Insinuated or inferred in there is that you understand God's already done his part. He put this power on the inside of you. It's at your disposal. And now you flip the switch. You speak to the problem. But most of us are saying, oh God, I've got this problem. Would you please take it away? God, that's, God, he's not going to violate his word. He's not going to come out here and t flip the switch for you. He's put the power on the inside of you. You flip the switch by using your words and talking to the problem. You know, an example of this is I was in Charlotte, North Carolina, and a woman had had pain for, I think it was... Uh, is over seven years, seven, 10 years or something like that. And the doctor said that on a scale to one to 10, she was a constant 11. She had terrible pain. She was totally invalid. She had to stay at home, couldn't do anything. And the only way she existed, she strapped magnets all over her body and then put magnets sewn into a blanket. And somehow the electrical fields between these magnets lessened her pain. And that's the way she lived, wrapped in these magnets. And a friend, I was at this woman's house, told her about some of the miracles that I'd seen and told her that if she'd come over, she could be healed. So anyway, she came over and she was sitting on this couch and I started talking to her and she says, I know God can heal, but you know, I believe God has given this to me to glorify him. And so I started countering that belief and then I countered this belief and I spent about 25 minutes just countering all of her wrong thinking and then I sat on the coffee table and I grabbed her hands and I, and I said, I'm going to pray and we're going to get rid of this pain. So I spoke and commanded the pain to leave. And I didn't talk to God and ask him to heal her. I took my authority and I commanded the pain to leave, commanded the devil to leave. And I got mad and rebuked it. And when I got through, I said, how do you feel? And she says, all the pain's gone. She stood up and took the blanket off and she had no pain. She was moving around. And she says, but I still have a stinging right here in my waist, right in the back. Why didn't the stinging leave? I said, you didn't tell me you had a stinging. I said, watch this. And then I spoke and I said, stinging in the name of Jesus, I command you to leave. And I got mad and commanded it to leave. And it was all gone. So I took Mark chapter 11, verse 23, and taught her the things we've just been talking about that you have to talk to the problem. You have to take your authority. Instead of asking God to do it, you, he told you in Matthew 10, 8, you heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. He didn't tell you to ask him to heal the sick. He said, you heal the sick. I've put this power on the inside of you. Now take your authority and you command the sick to be healed. And I taught her all of these things. It took about 25 minutes or so. 
So anyway, as she was getting ready to leave, she put her hand on the doorknob and she stopped and then she looked over at me and she says, the stinging is back. And I said, well, I've just been teaching you what to do, so I'm going to let you pray. And I joined hands with her. And you got to remember that 50 minutes before this, this woman was a Presbyterian that thought that God was the one that made her sick, that this was glorifying God. And so she came a long ways in 50 minutes. And, and near, this is nearly word for word what she said. She said, Father, I thank you that you are not getting glory out of this. You did not make me sick. By your stripes, I was healed. If I was healed, I am healed. I claim my healing in the name of Jesus. Amen. That's not a good prayer. Some of you, what's wrong with that? Everything that I said was good, but that's not what the Lord told you to do. And yet that's how most people pray. And so I said, how are you? And she says, it's still stinging. And I said, do you know why? And she said, no. And I said, you didn't do what I just taught you to do. And so she said, tell me again. And I said, you're supposed to speak to the problem. You talked to God. You said all of these great things about God and everything you said was true, but you didn't take your authority and you did not speak to your problem. And she says, you mean I'm supposed to stay, say stinging? in the name of Jesus? And I said, yes. And she said, I'll do it. So we joined hands again and she, she got mad and she said, stinging in the name of Jesus. And that's as far as she got. And she says, it's gone. <laughs> and that was in 2001. And that woman is still healed of those problems. <laughs> Amen. But see, we, we aren't saying the right thing. Somebody asks you how you are and you just bless you out all of your unbelief, every hurt and pain. Here's what the doctor said. And you say all of these things. And then you wonder, why aren't I healed? Because death and life are in the power of the tongue. Not just life, but death and life. And we're hung by our own tongue. We're snared by the words of our mouth. And we've got to start using our words correctly. This woman said, if I can touch but his clothes, I shall be healed. You got to start using your words. And it says you can have what you say. Most people say what they have, but you can have what you say. There's a big difference. Most people, when somebody asks you how you are, you say what you have instead of having what you say. You can use your words to create. There's creative power in your words. You can speak healing into existence. You can speak finances into existence. And again, some people think, oh yeah, so you're just going to make God do this. You've missed everything I've said. God's already done his part. You aren't making God do anything. You are humbling yourself and saying, Father, I believe it's done. I am not waiting on you to heal me. I am not waiting on you to prosper me. I'm not waiting on you to take depression away. I'm not waiting on you. You're waiting on me to believe that you've done your part and that you've given me power and authority. And so you stand up and agree with God and you enforce what he's already done. It's not you that's the source, but it's in you and you're the one that has the switch. And until you flip it, the power is not going to flow. It's amazing how people tend to fall out on one side or the other of this, but they can't seem to get the balance between it. They either get over here to where, all right, I'm, it's up to me. I'm making everything happen. And boy, if you do that, you're about to crash and burn. You'll find out pretty quickly that you can't do it on your own. But then the other side, there's a ditch on both sides of the road. The other ditch is over here. Well, it's just up to God. It's by God's grace. And so you sit there and do nothing and that won't work either. You got to recognize it's not you. God's never had anybody qualified working for him yet. It's not going to be your goodness. It's not going to be your holiness, but you do have a part to play and you got to believe and you got to hear the word. You got to act on the word. You got to get committed to where you will not take no for an answer. God would never give you no, but the devil and the circumstances in the world will sometimes delay the things of God. And you have to just get to a place where I'm not putting up with this. 
And then you have to use your words. And like I said, this is only four things, but there's probably a hundred things that I could share with you that are important about receiving from God. These are just a few things. But God's kingdom operates by law. And when this woman connected these things, the power of God flowed without Jesus even sizing her up, passing a judgment upon her. It wasn't a personal decision. It's not God that healed one person and didn't heal another. It's one person put the laws into effect and another person didn't. And sometimes you put the laws into effect without even realizing it. It's just nearly accidental. You know, uh, Benjamin Franklin, we were all taught about him flying a kite with a key on it in a rainstorm and electricity hit that kite and came down. And it's a wonder he wasn't killed. He stumbled onto some things. He made some discoveries and it was nearly by mistake. It's not the way you're supposed to do it, but you can stumble onto some things. Like I said last night, even a blind squirrel will get a nut every once in a while if he doesn't quit. <laughs> And you get determined, you can see some things happen, but the more you understand how the kingdom works, the more you understand laws, then it just, it makes it clear. I understand now why I saw my grandmother die, my father die, this girl that I was engaged to die, because we violated the laws. We were ignorant of the laws. It wasn't malicious on anybody's part, but just ignorance. I saw a bumper sticker once that said, ignorance is bliss. And that's an absolute lie. What you don't know is killing you. My people perish for a lack of knowledge. And brothers and sisters, one of the things that has helped me the most is to recognize that the kingdom of God operates by law. And I hadn't even got time to teach on this, but when I was pastoring a church, this is back in the, uh, when would that have been? The 70s. And when I was pastoring churches and stuff, I taught on these things. And healing can Man, I hate to even say some of this because I don't have time to answer it. But healing can be controlled. You can make healing anointing flow. You can put the anointing into a piece of cloth and send it through the mail. And a person can get healed by touching that cloth. It's tangible. Acts 19, 11, Paul did that. You can do it. I, I prayed with somebody at our picnic on Sunday and we prayed over cloth and I hadn't heard a report back, but I've seen many people heal by putting the anointing in a cloth. It's, it's not the same as electricity or something like that, but it's, it's got laws like that. Electricity can be controlled. The anointing can be controlled. Healing can be controlled. You can make healing flow. And back when I was pastor in the church, I taught these things and we told people, says, we're going to pray with you until we see you healed. And we had people brought in on their deathbed, people brought in in ambulances, people brought in who the doctor said had less than 24 hours to live. I had people with broken bones and if they had a broken bone, we would cut their cast off and make them act well. I know some of you think I'm extreme, and I am extreme. That's the reason I don't pastor. <laughs> I'd probably have lawsuits out the wazoo if I did all this, but that's what we would do. And if a person had pain, I'd hit them where they had pain. I remember one guy, he was a Mexican, and he came back, and he says, me came back from Paducah today, not too feeling real good. And his jaw was swelled up because he had had his teeth removed, and it was black and blue. And I prayed for him and then slapped him upside that jaw. And did you know in seconds, it was gone and he was totally normal. I prayed with a woman one time that had migraine headaches and she was crying. She hurt so bad. And I, I told everybody I was going to hit him if I prayed for him. And um, so I, I was a little tentative. And so after I prayed for her, I kind of bumped her on the head like that. And she said, oh, hit me harder, Brother Andrew. So I just called back and wham. She was healed. And over a two-year period of time, we never had a single person come in. And I had them brought in on stretchers from ambulances. We didn't have a single person that didn't manifest. There were, let me rephrase that. There was one girl that had an eczema, a little uh, seven or eight-year-old girl that we prayed for a number of times, and I didn't see her manifest that healing. 
She did get over it in a few months, but it didn't happen instantly. But with the exception of that, I saw burns, third degree burns, instantly heal, saw blindness heal. You can make healing manifest. And I used, when I say that we saw the people healed, sometimes I'd stay with them four and five hours. And I'd pray until we saw it manifest. You can make the healing power of God manifest. I hesitate to say that because I'm not going to stay around four or five hours and pray with 2,000 people. And every time I say this, somebody wants to come and just have me pray with them forever, and I'm not doing it. I'm, gonna, I'm teaching you how to do it. But I am saying that there are laws that govern healing, and you can make healing manifest. It's up to you. But if you have this mindset, oh, God, I pray, and then you just, all right, Father, I'm waiting on you. You aren't waiting on God. God's not the one who's stuck. You aren't waiting on God to heal you. God's waiting on you to renew your mind and to begin to start putting the laws into motion to resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Some things do take a period of time. If you're praying for finances, sometimes, you know, God speaks to somebody who's going to be your supply. And it may be their unbelief and their hindrance that's slowing you down. And you might have to be patient. With me, my finances come through the people I minister to. And did you know, I imagine Matt and Lynn have experienced this, but when 9-11 happened, anytime that the tsunamis happen, anytime a hurricane happens, anytime there's a natural tragedy, people turn off my television program and they go to watching the news because they're interested in wanting to find out what happened and out of sight, out of mind, and my income typically will go down every time there's a natural tragedy. Not because I'm in unbelief, not because I did anything wrong, but people aren't seeing my program. They're doing something else. And because of it, they don't give. I didn't do anything wrong. It's not my fault. There's, but God uses people. And so sometimes my finances can be affected when there's nothing that I'm doing, but there's people that are involved in it. They aren't my source, but God uses people. And so when you're doing something like a, a job, when you're, doing, when you're praying for another person, there can be other things that enter in. But if you're praying for yourself, something that is absolutely 100% God's will for you, it's up to you. To release the power of God and you can make the power of God manifest. Amen. Amen. And I know some of you think this is the strangest thing I've ever heard. Well, let me ask you, how's, how's the way you're believing working? <laughs> you know, with the exception, I think I mentioned this the other day, uh, with the exception of me just being stupid and, and hurting myself and having to lay in bed because I overdid it, I hadn't been sick in 48 years. I don't believe in getting sick. I don't get sick. I get temptations to be sick the same as anybody else. I just don't take them. I've learned how to release healing. Until you get better results than what I'm getting, maybe you ought to consider there's a better way to pray. Amen. 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 Praise God. This ought to bless you. But there's a lot of people that what this does... It's like it, it makes you, uh, it makes it so that I, I don't have an excuse anymore. And there's a lot of people that would rather just, well, I'm waiting on God. It's in God's hands. It's God's timing and everything else. And they, they find comfort in that because you can still watch as the stomach turns on the television and not seek God, not renew your mind, not get angry, not get desperate, not do anything. You can be as carnal as your unsaved neighbor and just keep saying, well, I'm waiting on God. And it just strips all of your excuses. So there's a lot of people don't like what I'm saying, but for those of you who will receive it, I tell you, this could change your life to understand that the kingdom of God operates on laws. God has already done everything. He's anticipated all of your problems. The supply was made before you ever had a need. And it's not a matter of you praying and just hoping that God is in a good mood today and will answer your prayer. He's already done it. He's already commanded the blessing upon you. You've already got it. Now it's up to you to release it and to see it come to pass. 
And all I may have done tonight is just stir you up to where, man, this is a new way of looking at things. I may not have given you the keys that you need to be able to do it. But, you know, just understanding this principle is worth a lot. And then you can get into the Word of God and the Holy Spirit can teach you the things that are specifically your issue and things that you need to do. But you need to get this new paradigm that God's already done His part. He is seated at the Father's right hand. Jesus said, it's finished. Jesus isn't healing people today. He's not saving people today. He's already forgiven the sins of the whole world. By His stripes you were healed. There are people that are discovering their salvation and discovering their healing just the same way that we're discovering the laws of flight and the laws of electricity, but they've been here all along and it wasn't God who just created them. They've been here. It's us that are just discovering them. And boy, this just blesses me to know that God, you aren't the one that's holding out on me. If anybody's holding out, it's me. It's my carnality that's stopping you. And man, that motivates me to seek more and to learn more and to do more. And when I do experience a problem, don't see something come to pass. I just say, Father, you didn't fail me. You know, when my son was, I'll close with this, believe it or not. But when my son died, Jamie and I had just gotten home at 2.15 in the morning. And at 4.15, we got a call from my oldest son. And he said, Dad, I'm sorry to tell you, but Peter is dead. And I said, what happened? And he told me, and he'd been dead at that time for four hours. And um, after four hours, they took him to the hospital. And uh, anyway, they did everything they could to revive him and couldn't revive him. And so they pronounced him dead, put him in a morgue, in a cooler, on a slab, stripped naked with a toe tag on. And then they came out and told my oldest son, Joshua, that he was dead. So Joshua called us and told us, and you know what? I put these laws into practice. And I said, don't you let anybody touch him till I get there. I said, the first report's not the last report. And then Jamie and I prayed and agreed. This is back before we had cell phones. We live way out in the country. It's over an hour into Colorado Springs from where we live. And so we had to get up, get dressed, and we had to go in. And so there was an hour period of time that we didn't know what the results was. And there was a potential that my son wouldn't come back from the dead. And that's not a negative confession because, you know, my son has a choice in this. My son killed himself, not intentionally, but he overdosed on drugs and he killed himself. And on the way in, I just started, I, I was feeling fear. I was feeling discouragement, grief, sorrow, the same thing that anybody else would feel. And instead of speaking it, Jamie and I were smart enough to know that you're snared by the words of your mouth. And so we didn't speak our unbelief. But I was feeling all of these negative things so strong. I started using my words to fight against this. And I just started saying, Father, in the name of Jesus, you aren't the one that failed me. You didn't kill my son. You aren't guilty. This isn't your fault. And I said, I'm praising you. And I don't care if my son comes back to life or not. I'm going to praise you. I'm going to worship you. I'm going to serve you. And I just started speaking my faith. And you know, when I did that, the Lord reminded me of prophecies. And I had two prophecies in California and in Ireland. And people that had never seen me, had never heard of me, walked up to me out of the blue and said, you got two boys. And the oldest, I mean, the youngest is going to turn to the Lord before the oldest. And they prophesied things to me. They didn't know I had children. They didn't know that I had boys or girls. They didn't know that they weren't seeking the Lord. They didn't know any of this. It had to be a word from God. And as I got to praising God, these prophecies came back to my remembrance and it just dawned on me, if those were true words from God, which I knew that they were, my son hadn't turned back to the Lord yet. And I said, he's got to live. And all of a sudden I started laughing. I, I started laughing. I said, man, this is awesome. I told Jamie, this is going to be the greatest miracle we've ever seen. And she knew enough not to say anything. She probably thought I had lost it, that I just snapped. Because here I was driving into town to see our dead son who had been dead five hours by the time we got there. And uh, she probably thought I'd lost it, but she didn't say anything. And anyway, when we got in, my son came out and he said, Dad, I don't know what happened, but five or 10 minutes after I called you, Peter sat up and started talking and he was just 
totally normal, no brain damage, no more than he had before, praise God. And today he's just, he's just awesome, doing really good. And he had a daughter born the next year who's 14 now, and uh, she's just awesome. And you know, all of that happened because of these laws. And one of the things that was key, I knew that if I didn't see the results that I wanted, it's not because God failed me. It would have been because I failed him or my son had a part to play in it or something. But man, I don't get mad at God. If the plane crashes and I can't figure out what it is, I never blame the law of gravity or the law of aerodynamics for failing. Those things are constant. It's something else. I'll have to write it off as pilot error or something. And if anything in my life hasn't worked, it's not God who's ever failed me. It's I didn't know enough to do, do things properly. And there's some people that are so insecure, they can't accept that. I just couldn't live with myself if I thought that it was my failure that somebody died. Well, you need to find out who you are in Christ and you need to understand how much God loves you and just, you know, own up to it. Every one of us has failed. Every one of us, we're fallen human beings. And if you can't face the fact that you've ever made a mistake, that's a big problem. That's a big problem. You just need to recognize it. Man, we've all made mistakes. We're in varying degrees of making mistakes. I've come a long ways, but man, when something doesn't work for me, it doesn't shock me. Matter of fact, I'm somewhat surprised that things work as well as they do for me. <laughs> Amen. I'm just blessed. So I encourage you tonight to receive this and to start looking at things differently and recognize God is not the one who's failing us. God has never failed. There are laws that govern the kingdom of God. You may not know what they are, but don't sit there and condemn God and justify yourself. That's what Job did. Don't be like Job. You may not understand what's going on, but man, just say that uh, I don't know what the problem is, but it's not God. God, you're faithful and go to worship it and praising God. And when you do, God will quicken things to you. But when you're just sitting there griping and complaining and going against everything he said, you probably aren't going to hear much. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I was anticipating winding up a little bit different than I did tonight. It's kind of somber. But you know what? There may be some of you. I, I want to do this because it's really important. I've known people that have limped through life because they really tried to believe God, usually for somebody else, not acknowledging that the other person had a part to play in this or possibly that maybe you didn't have it all figured out yet and that maybe you, maybe you were sincere. You might have been sincere as you could be, but you just didn't have it all figured out. And...
quên bề thật vui khi ta có nhau trong đời một ngày cứ thế trôi qua và ta nhận lại bao nhiêu tiếng cười ơ ơ mình chỉ nhớ đi quanh phố phường ơ ơ anh là người khiến con tim em mát thương chỉ cần ngày vẫn nắng lên đem về buộc được sáng tên là cuộc đời của ta cứ trôi như êm đềm chỉ cần ngày vẫn nắng lên đem về buộc được sáng tên là cuộc đời của ta sống trong mini game mình nhảy múa trong phòng toàn hơi men cùng đắm say trong đi ở nhà cũ mẹ một cùng đưa nhau sang Paris để người trai tim ta thân thi làm những điều mà ta muốn khi nhà chim thì ta xuống ôm cả ly khi trẻ đến nơi đây vẫn còn suy đừng mơ đến được vì như hồng màu bất chấp độ yêu anh như tình yêu màu hồng Hồng màu bất chế độ yêu anh như 